Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Oxford Internet Institute's final webinar of this academic year, featuring Dr. Corinne Kathsbeth, hosted today by Professor Gina Neff. Dr. Kathsbeth will be discussing the Internet's reluctant sheriffs, content moderation and political gatekeeping through Internet infrastructure. A little housekeeping, we are fortunate to have a varied audience with a wide range of views, and we request that the opinions of others are respected in this space. For your awareness, this event is being recorded and will be posted on our website following the event. You can pose any question using the Q&A tab at any time, and these will be answered towards the end of the talk. Questions will be visible to all attendees and can be upvoted and commented upon, and we will endeavour to follow up on any unanswered queries. Please allow me to introduce Professor Gina Neff. Hello, welcome, good day, wherever in the world you might be. It is my great honor tonight to be able to host what is the final of our webinars uh, in the OII Wednesday webinar series this year. With me is a special honor and privilege of um, introducing Dr. Corinne Kathsbeth. I um, was fortunate enough to be one of Corinne's advisors in her doctoral journey here at the Oxford Internet Institute. And um, I was joined by um, the incredible uh, head of department, Vicki Nash and Luciano Floridi in the work of training Corinne. But I really should say Dr. Kathsbeth trained us. And I'd like to take just a moment before she starts to say what's so exciting about the work that she does and what we're um, in what what she has, I know, in store for us today. The two things really um, commend this research and this project. The the first is that we talk a lot about technical infrastructure and technology shaping how we make C connect the world, and yet we don't really have very good studies of the infrastructure itself. And so first, Dr. Kathsbeth has really beautifully done a project where she's looked at the making of the infrastructure through some really mundane processes, some real just everyday organizational politics that go into making the tools and technologies that you and I rely on every single day. We're relying on them right now. And the second thing that, that I hope she'll touch on tonight is that, you know, we talk about the power of big tech and we talk about big tech as being this amorphous and um, really not very transparent um, set of power, a uh, set of powerful uh, organizations and societal institutions. And, and often students struggle with and think about, you know, if only I could get access. And, and Dr. Kathsbeth, for her, for her research, really figured out one way to get big tech on the record, which is to read and watch what they say in public and open meetings. And so when you put these two pieces together, how do we look at infrastructure and how do we look at the powerful actors in making that infrastructure, you, you end up with a, an incredibly rich portrait of um, the power behind the decisions that affect all of us every day. So with very uh, little further ado, I would like to introduce Corinne, Dr. Corinne Kathsbeth, who will speak to us today about her doctoral research, The Internet's Reluctant Sheriffs. And may we please have the slides. Corinne, over to you. Um, thank you for this incredibly kind introduction. And uh, thank you to the OII for hosting me on the, on the last webinar of, uh, of the academic year. And also thank you to, to Professor Jean and for facilitating this conversation. I mean, it is really thanks to her guidance and that of Professor Victoria Nash and Luciano Floridi as my supervisors that I am now speaking at my own department um, as a certified doctor of the internet. Um, but I also want to thank all of you who've taken the time out of your busy schedules to join me for this talk today about the politics of internet infrastructure. What I'll try and do over the next 25 minutes or so 
is to outline some pressing concerns regarding the growing role of internet infrastructure providers as unaccountable content moderators and political gatekeepers, and also um, perhaps highlighting some avenues for addressing these concerns. Next slide, please. As mentioned, my name is Corinne Kath. Uh, I'm a recent graduate from the uh, Oxford Internet Institute. I am an anthropologist um, who studies internet infrastructure and internet governance. And the talk that I'm gonna give today is broadly based on the four and a half years of PhD research that I did, in which I ethnographically studied the politics of internet infrastructure through participant observation, uh, by undertaking interviews, um, but also drawing from my previous work experience uh, as an advocate within digital rights and policy communities. Next slide, please. So my talk is broken up into four sections. First, I'll try and set the scene for understanding the skill and the impact of internet infrastructure. Then I'll try and outline uh, the power that its reluctant sheriffs uh, hold through two recent case studies. And then I'll try and identify a number of pressing concerns and really urge academics and policymakers to treat that conversation about the role of internet infrastructure in mediating societal values with as much urgency as they do questions related to platform accountability, for example. And then concluding, I hope to, together with you, um, identify, identify a future research agenda and what that should look like on these burning matters. But mostly today, um, I will be talking about why many of us had a bad day last week, Tuesday, or at least a bad hour, uh, when a really important internet infrastructure provider called Fastly dealt with a configuration error that led many major websites, including Reddit, PayPal, the BBC, and various government websites, including the one through which I was about to book my COVID-19 vaccination shot to become temporarily unavailable. And what I wanna try and do in the first half of the talk is really use the case study of Fastly to contour the power of internet infrastructure providers in our everyday online experience and explain how internet infrastructure actors intervene in political debates in a way that really sets up its architects and its uh, CEOs as political gatekeepers. Now I'll do so by highlighting these two relatively recent cases in which these companies and organizations building and maintaining the often invisible infrastructure of the internet made explicit political decisions that directly affected what platforms and information was made available and to whom. Um, and for those in the know, uh, I'm talking about Cloudflare's decision to suspend its services to HM, a messaging board, and Amazon's more recent decision to suspend its or temporarily suspend its contract with Parler, uh, a social media company. And for those partially in the know, please bear with me because this will all make sense in a minute. Now, my overall research interest really lies with how and when internet infrastructure providers like the ones that I mentioned before intervene in politics. Um, the political project of my work is really geared towards clarifying different instances of infrastructural power, in particular in cases that receive relatively limited airtime in public policy, uh, in, in the public and policy debates. Now, <laughs> I want to caveat that by saying that um, questions of internet infrastructure are um, and, and power and politics have long been subject of debates in academia as well as in civil society. And my work, especially my PhD work, really stands on the shoulders of giants like Susan Lee Starr, Karen Ruliter, uh, Jeffrey Bowker, Laura Denardis, Paul Dorish. Um, Chris Kelty, Alondra Nelson, Lisa Parks, Joan Donovan, Biela Coleman, Ashwin Matthew, and many, many others. And then finally, I really invite you to think along with me about what a comprehensive future research agenda for internet infrastructure should look like, but also conversely, what novel insights bringing an infrastructural lens um, has to offer to ongoing debates about social media and platform governance. Next slide, kindly. So 
on Tuesday, the 8th of June, about a week ago, um, I got a very frantic call from my brother who told me that my age cohort could now sign up for the COVID-19 vaccination. Um, but when I rushed to the online government portal to sign up, I showed a 503 status unavailable code. And this code usually indicates that a server is currently unable to handle the request due to a temporary overloading or maintenance issue. Or to put that a little bit more plainly, um, the government was unable to give me the appointment information that I needed due to a breakdown in the communication between its website and the server that stored the information that I needed. Now, there are many, many reasons why these kind of communication breakdowns between websites and servers can happen. But the one that caused me not to be able to access the government portal was particularly interesting as it turned out that it originated from a single company, but impacted large swaths of our online ecosystem, including the multiple websites uh, that I mentioned before that have very large traffic footprints like rather than PayPal and Amazon, et cetera. But also a number of pretty crucial government websites. Now, the company that caused this major infraction in the accessibility of online content is called Fastly. Um, Fastly is one of a handful of companies providing what is called content delivery network services or CDNs. And in order to understand what happened, it is important that we get a little bit technical um, and talk about how the internet works below the applications that we all use on a daily basis. Um, next slide, please. So taking, um, taking a couple of steps back, the internet was billed as a peer-to-peer -peer network, which enables each user to request and access content on a peer's computer, which would then act as the server hosting that particular content. Now, <laughs> the size of the world and the physical limits of cables and wires that make up the internet mean that content requested on a hosting server that is far away will take longer to load. And one way around this is to store content on a server near you, essentially. So it takes less time to fetch it. And this essentially means that your content loads faster, which is both what consumers expect and what companies profit from. Um, enter companies like Fastly and Cloudflare, excuse me, and Akamai and Amazon, and other cloud computing uh, companies that provide these so-called content delivery networks or CDNs. And these companies like Fastly provide websites with the servers that will host their content close to where it's likely to be requested. Now, most big companies and organizations and governments um, use these CDN services, as we saw last week. Um, the CDN market, however, is relatively small with only a handful of players. Um, which means that if one of those players has an issue, a substantial part of its clientele and the websites that they run are likely to be affected. Now, Fastly is only the fifth biggest of the CDN players, with almost 89% of the market being in the hands of Cloudflare, Amazon, and Akamai. Uh, Next slide, please. So the importance of CDNs as internet infrastructure uh, which in my research I define drawing from infrastructure studies um, as the reliable, transparent, widely shared aspects of the internet that are visible to users when it breaks down. It means that a technical mistake in a single company can have quite big ramifications. Now this in turn raises a lot of questions about the danger of power consolidation in these markets um, and the unquestioned influence that these often invisible actors have over our experience of websites and our access to information. Um, and there are many different um, aspects of internet infrastructure where we see this combined concern of consolidation and fragility in a sense that things can go wrong that tend to be ignored really until, until they come front and center due to some sort of massive failure that 
catapults their existence into our everyday imaginary and into our everyday use of the internet, only to recede again when the immediate problem is resolved. Now, while this particular case of Fastly is not unique as such, um, both Cloudflare and Amazon have had similar outages over the past years. In many ways, it's comparatively benign. Um, and I agree, I agree with many other commentators, some of whom I know are watching this talk right now, um, that there is a real consolidation of power concern in the CDN market. But at the same time, the outage did not necessarily stem from a, did not stem from a systemic fragility or from a political decision as such made by Fastly. Rather, it came from a technical bug, which was for all intents and purposes fixed in under an hour. Um, Next slide, please. Now, in the first half of this talk, I tried to use the recent internet outage caused by Fastly to establish the skill of influence that infrastructure actors have over our online experience. What I wanna try and do in the second half is focus on what happens when these actors explicitly, rather than accidentally, use that power to intervene in political debates, which is another thing that has happened repeatedly over the past year. Years, excuse me. Next slide, please. So two examples of such explicit political intervention by infrastructure actors that happened during my PhD research were when Amazon temporarily suspended its web hosting services to Parler which is a social media platform that brands itself as free speechy um, and, and as a right-wing alternative to Twitter. Um, and Amazon did so in the wake of the storming of the US Capitol this January. Now, Amazon's decision to withhold its services essentially rendered Parler's website offline, albeit temporarily. Um, and Amazon made this decision over the violent and threatening content on Parler's platform. And now this is interesting because this is a clear policy decision from below. Um, it's, it's from the infrastructure up, so to speak, as opposed to what is a little bit, what we're a little bit more used to following from top-down government mandated regulations or by a platform applying its own policy to the content that it hosts. Now, this is interesting um, because it captures this growing trend of infrastructural intervention by which Amazon decided that it had an obligation to act on their interpretation of the public interest and seize its services to parlor. A second example of a similar dynamic happened in the summer of 2019 when Cloudflare, which is another big CDN company, suspended its services to a messaging board called HM in the wake of a mass shooting in which that messaging board was used by the shooter to sort of share his racist manifesto um, and for others to cheer him on. Now, I wanna get a little bit deeper into this particular case study because it does a really good job of exemplifying um, the concerns around such infrastructural interventions when done without clear internal or external guardrails. What Cloudflare did for this extremist messaging board as what it does for its 19 million other customers um, is providing both security services to websites and facilitating the fast delivery of content that we spoke about earlier. Um, in that process, Cloudflare makes decisions on a daily basis about what information is available online. Um, initially, Cloudflare refused to take HN's website down um, even after some public pressure to do so. But within 24 hours, they actually reversed that decision and seized their services to HN, temporarily kicking it off the internet. And when, when explaining his decision to remove HN, Matthew Prince, who's the CEO of Cloudflare, argued that Cloudflare should neither have to make such decisions nor necessarily explain them to the public. Um, Cloudflare has no responsibility because its services are neutral. And Prince called Cloudflare a mere conduit 
And he said that unlike YouTube and Facebook, um, Cloudflare doesn't organize or promote content. And as such, it's an impartial facilitator. And uh, that means the company cannot and should not be held responsible, nor for the content that it hosts, nor for the political decisions that it subsequently makes about that content. Now, throughout my research, um, I found that this particular view of internet infrastructure as being, as being neutral um, is really widespread among internet companies and engineers. But they also often employ it to abdicate a sense of corporate responsibility by pointing to the supposed neutrality of their services. And um, Cloudflare's decision to pull the plug for certain websites, however, is discordant with the neutrality they also claim. And at the same time, this presumed neutrality is a really poor starting point for addressing the responsibility of internet companies vis-a-vis -vis the public interest and rights. And so what we see in both of these cases um, with the Amazon suspension and the Cloudflare suspension is that these companies made internal decisions that rendered websites inaccessible um, based on you know, justifiable reasons from their perspective, but, not, but, but without much follow-up in terms of discussing their rationales in terms of reconsidering the responsibility that they have moving forward as overall providers of internet infrastructure. And the thing that I'm interested in both from an academic but also an advocacy perspective is the underlying question that this reality raises. One that worries many academics um, and advocates, including myself, which is the fact that these decisions are often fueled by the wavering standpoints of you know, what I've called the share of CEOs that run such infrastructure companies. And while it's on the one hand possible to perceive that and easy to perceive that as a good thing in the case of such evidently racist and violent content, um, these unaccountable interventions made by individual companies and technical organizations are a really unstable foundation for conversations about human rights online. In particular, when we see that it's like only real life de death and violence merits a discontinuation of a service. Um, when that's the only bar, then these invisible CEOs really reveal themselves no better than the old West sheriffs who intervened at will and only if murder took place in plain sight. Now, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about this particular case study, um, Suzanne van Geus and I of the University of Toronto wrote a piece for the Brookings Institute last summer in which we also introduced the phrase, uh, the internet's reluctant shares. Um, both of these case studies show that there are many unanswered questions about how to ensure that A, uh, infrastructure actors take responsibility for the power they exert. Um, B, that they do so in a manner that moves beyond their preferred framing of their work as neutral and impartial infrastructure maintenance. And also C, articulates, a clear, articulates really clear accountability and responsibility frameworks both internally within these organizations, but also externally through the development of soft norms and regulation. And next slide, please. So this brings me to the question of um, future research agendas. Now, I have some thoughts on this, both in terms of, of uh, very concrete recommendations um, in the case of the internet outage that spurred our conversation today, um, as well as what is needed more broadly when internet infrastructure providers intervene explicitly in society to make sure that um, you know, internet infrastructure gets an accountability update for lack of a better metaphor. Now here are some of my broader reflections that draw from, from my PhD research. Um, as the debate about online political gatekeeping will continue to take a turn to the infrastructure, as Laura Donardis and Francesca Musiani and others have described it so comprehensively, um, I do really think that the challenge 
for us or part of the challenge is to refuse these actors self description as neutral and really counter their tendency to make political decisions ad hoc with strong calls for accountability. And this also requires us to gather, gather together experts around this issue in a more organized and structural way, as we are seeing happening in the area of platform governance, which, for example, recently saw the launch of the um, platform governance research network. Um, and we also see that there are a lot of lively policy debates around questions of platform governance. Um, now, gathering these experts also means moving beyond the bounds of academia and making sure that policymakers, civil society, and others are get really excited about the nuts and bolts of the internet. And there are some really interesting steps happening towards that through debates in Europe about the Digital Services Act. Um, and in this, and in the US, this work is taking shape through think tanks like and organizations like the ACLU, uh, CAP, the Center for Democracy and Technology, the Internet Governance Lab, the Shorenstein Center, and crucially, funders like the Ford Foundation and the MacArthur Foundation. Now, I am very fortunate that the Ford Foundation is providing me with ongoing support um, to further my work on these questions and efforts now that I've finalized my PhD research. Um, I also have a number of thoughts on what can be done to ensure stronger accountability on a more granular level. For instance, by working with public interest mandates for CDNs, um, developing requirements for governments and public institutes to have multiple CDN contracts so people can schedule their COVID-19 shots. Um, and thinking about codes of conduct or know your customer requirements for infrastructure companies, but perhaps we can leave those more granular um, discussions for the Q&A. Um, next slide. So in concluding, uh, like any good academic, I wanna leave you with a question, which I hope can inform our discussion for the time that we have remaining, which is, what does accountability and oversight look like when it comes to questions of internet infrastructure? And what does it take? Um, because it is evidently clear that internet infrastructure and the actors that maintain and build it mediate our lives and that they can't be, and that like that infrastructure cannot be governed by the whims of reluctant sheriffs. Um, who hold infrastructural power for which they should feel a commensurate amount of responsibility. And on that note, I would like to thank you for being given the opportunity to set out my research and kickstart uh, this conversation about what a research agenda could and should look like. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne, for this great talk. So we've got a set of questions already um, coming in the chat. I want to point people down to the bottom of your screen, the, the, the Q&A tab. You can post questions there. You can upvote questions. You can comment on questions. Um, and we'll get to those in just a few moments. So um, you know, you've talked a lot about um, trying to understand power in this environment. What was challenging for you in terms of um, doing a research project about something that you're so um, you, you that you have a really strong advocacy role in? So what were some of the challenges in, in doing research for you in this space? Um, the interesting thing that is that I found that the organization that I focused my ethnographic work on the Internet Engineering Task Force is a place where many people have really passionate opinions mm -hmm. about the internet, you know, past, present, future. And so, especially because I came into that from a human rights background, um, I worried for a while 
in terms of how my interlocutors were going to perceive me. Um, but I actually found that the fact that I had opinions in many ways made my um, ability to engage in debates easier because it meant that we could have we could have these sort of conversations going back and forth and agreeing or disagreeing with each other. Mm -hmm. So what I thought was going to be a major hurdle actually turned out to be a good thing in the sense that they expect you to have thought about things and they will challenge you on that. And that's the culture of the place. I think what, what was more challenging were some of the practical things. So we tend to think about uh, places in internet governance, whether it's the internet corporation for assigned names of numbers or the internet engineering task force or other, um, other organizations with names that are way too long and acronyms that are way too confusing um, as fundamentally open. Mm -hmm. However, yes, yes, the mailing lists are open. Anyone can read them. Anyone could technically speaking show up at a meeting and contribute. However, in practice, as with any organization, there are real cultural barriers. Um, in the case of the IETF, there's the costs. So they have rotating meetings across, to, across the continents, and they mm -hmm. tend to host these meetings in incredibly uh, nice four or five star big hotels. Um, so that means that you need to have money to or uh, someone who can sponsor for you to fly to these places three times a year. So that's flights, visa, hotel, stay, et cetera. Um, and it turned out that that, as a graduate student, is actually more, <laughs> more complicated to make happen than one would think. And the other thing is that some of these organizations have some real issues around um, sexism and racism, right? There's, there's really no way to, to sugarcoat this. These are not places that are necessarily easy to contribute to if if you're um if you deviate from the standard so so those were some of the things that i ran into and and i luckily i was able to sort of include those in my phd as another level of sort of cultural analysis of what goes on in these places one of the things that i find really interesting about your work is um this idea of politics on different levels that you know, on the one hand, the human rights advocates that you write about um, in in the in the thesis are really, you know, pushing to bring more um, uh, normative values into code, and we we talk a lot about this right now in conversations about responsible technologies and conversations about um, ethical AI, about how to actually build these kind of normative, but. But then when you when you you know work with the people who are making these decisions, they have a very different set of frameworks by which they're judging what their remit is, what their values are. What what kind of what kind of um, landscape or environment do you think that presents for us for thinking through how to how to normatively change things, how to how to how to do politics on different levels? Um. Yeah, such a such a um, beautiful and comprehensive question, as always. Um, I mean, it in this particular case, it, it obviously raised a number of, of questions. Um, part of the issue that I encountered, even within my field work, is that there are very different understandings, as you mentioned, of politics. Um, and one of the things that the organization that I focused on, they have sort of this informal mantra that goes something along the lines of, um, we are not the protocol police. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that mantra is so incredibly ingrained to the point where a number of human rights advocates recently published a document that says, okay, if you guys aren't, then here's sort of a spoof document that establishes the protocol police, just to sort of point out the tension of, you know, you, you might say that there are no politics here, but saying that there are no politics is an incredibly political decision or an incredibly mm -hmm. political thing to say. So I think one of the things that um, is the, the challenge as a researcher to look for is really to sort of unpick what that word means to different constituents and why that is the case. And what kind? What it affords them with, 
And so one of the things that I focus on very much in my work is that this notion of rejecting politics mm -hmm. um, should really be seen as like an anti-political attitude to engineering. And it also enables what I dubbed uh, engineered innocence. Mm -hmm. So the ability of engineers to be able to say, we're not responsible for this because we don't do politics. And that's a rhetorical move. And I think, especially when you're new to a field, like getting to that point where you understand the nuances of what, what is behind these sort of um, cultural shields almost of what politics is and isn't and who gets to draw those lines is, is the major challenge, but also sort of the most fruitful and exciting endeavor to, to pursue as a researcher. So really, so really looking at those, um, those kind of questions of, you know, what people, not only what people say they do, but what they say they don't do, and then what they do in response to what they say they don't do. And then on top of that, seeing the difference between what they say they do, and then what they actually do, which is obviously what sort of ethnographic methods are like uniquely set up to be able to do, because that's one of the many things that I also noticed, you know, walking around in this organization for many, many years is that People tend to, for instance, be really focused on like, we make protocols, we make standards, we write, we write these things that are interoperable. But then when you look at what happens during these meetings, it's a lot of sort of um, schmoozing. It's a lot of hobnobbing. It's, there aren't many people sitting down on their laptops, cranking out code in any kind of way. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of building human networks. Right, right. The first question we'll take um, today is from Ashwin Matthew. Um, there are many kinds of reluctant sheriffs, he asks on the internet, who play very different roles in infrastructure, as in the variation between the CDNs and the IETF, for instance. Can you comment on a typology of reluctant sheriffs to help us analyze these systems of power? I love that as an idea. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a really hard one. So I think a typology of of reluctant sheriff should have different axes. Um, I've touched on a couple of them in my talk. So I think one of the things to be really mindful of is uh, consolidation of power. Um, so for instance, the CDN market has a very limited number of very influential players. And I think that also gives quite a bit of leeway to these organizations to do as they see fit because they know that their clientele has very little um, other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's many examples of sort of network operators where it's much more diffuse, where it's much more horizontal in terms of like the kind of organizations that they run where that notion of the reluctant sheriff perhaps isn't the right way to describe what the power relationships look like in the decisions that they make. Um, so that's like a really, really uh, sort of initial typology, but that's definitely something that I would wanna move forward uh, on um, after I've recovered from just having submitted my PhD. Okay, you're allowed a week of holiday, but only a week. That's a, that's a bad joke. Um, the next question is from Pratik Vagari or Wagari. As someone who's looked deeply into the role of infrastructure companies as political gatekeepers, I wondered if you observed any difference in their approach, private actions, public positions, or the lack thereof, to less liberal regulatory systems like China or Russia, especially compared to those who operate at the presentation level. At disclosure, in a previous life, I managed CDN operations for some of the less liberal countries. So that is a, another really wonderful and <laughs> complicated question. Um, I'm going to have to make the classic academic move of, I, I would have loved to have done that, but my work has focused mostly on these questions within the American and the EU context. So I wouldn't be able to speak with any authority um, to that question, but I would welcome someone else who also speaks those languages and can read, you know, in, in the native tongues of the different countries that he's mentioning or they're mentioning um, to do that work. Because I think that is another really interesting sort of dynamic to see in terms of how do these different organizations that are so crucial to our experience of the internet, 
deal with questions of, of politics, both internally, but also political pressure that they might experience from, from the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. And this would be one of the great moments in time that we could actually have a better and different dialogue if we weren't on Zoom. But, but if we weren't on Zoom, it might be hard to get all of you in the little meeting room that we have at number one, St. Giles. The next question is from Steph oh, I, the, this wonderful system that we have on chat sometimes scrolls right in the middle of mine. You keep posting, keep posting those questions. I'll deal with the scrolling. Stefan Bortzmeier asks, can we really say that the Fastly issue was an internet infrastructure issue? The internet itself worked fine. All the other services, email, BitTorrent, Signal, Bitcoin, etc., and even the vast majority of the web had no problem. So what, what makes this internet infrastructure? So that's, that's a really fair question. And I appreciate Stefan bringing it up because this is a conversation that he and I actually had directly after, uh, after the Fastly outage. Um, I agree, obviously, that you know, there, there is no, starting with the fact that there is no such thing as the internet, right? Like that as a concept doesn't work. But when you give a talk that's aimed at different audiences, um, that's a heuristic that I end up working with. Um, I do think that you can consider CDN's internet as internet infrastructure. I do think that the kind of services that they provide um, have made an intervention in how the internet functions, right? And yes, I agree, it's, it's almost like an overlay uh, network on top of the internet, but when it doesn't work, you have the kind of breakdown that at least within the context of internet infrastructure studies is considered to be fundamental enough to say, we can classify this as infrastructure. And on top of that, I also don't, I understand Stefan's um, comment that this impacted a limited number of websites. At the same time, I think we should be careful about trivializing mm -hmm. which websites these were. Yeah. Um, I mean, I could not make an appointment for my COVID-19 vaccination. That can have real health, like a real health consequences. Um, people didn't have access to PayPal. That can have real life consequences. I mean, as I've, I've, as I've said before, you know, it's one thing if you can't access Netflix and you can't watch, you know, the last episode of whatever, The Crown, uh, Queen's Gambit, whatever you were watching, that's, that is trivial. But not having access to especially government services is not. Um, and, and that's something that I do want to keep front and center in, in these debates. Well, and something that you've talked a lot about, you know, and, and your work drawing on the on the work of Bowker and Starr is once infrastructure becomes, uh, you know, infrastructure isn't infrastructure until it's invisible. And the idea that we have public layers um, working on top of CDNs that are not necessarily what we think of as infrastructure is part and parcel of the problem, right? That we're, we're um, relying on pieces that work in a completely, um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system of patchwork in a way. Yeah. Um, uh, we had a question from a current Oxford Internet um, Institute student, Hannah Kirk. Hannah says, it's great talk. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I agree. It was a great talk. I found it really interesting what you said about AWS and other Internet gatekeepers acting in what they think is public interest. Could you comment on the role of these platforms to also protect users from online harms? And she gives the examples of misinformation or hate speech against the arguments that they actually should facilitate free speech? So, um, I mean, Hannah has really gotten at, at some of the um, <laughs> most complicated of debates here. Um, and I've seen a lot of very smart academics describe this phenomenon in different ways. So for instance, recently I listened to a podcast by, um, the Lawfare blog, where Quinta Jurassic said, like, your part of the problem is that um, if platforms themselves don't take responsibility for the content that's hosted there, mm 
then they push that responsibility down to infrastructure providers who should ideally for all of the different reasons that we've just outlined, uh, not be intervening in these kind of ways. The thing that I wanna point out here is that regardless of where you fall on the spectrum, they should or they shouldn't, or even the spectrum, these companies should lean more towards protecting um, freedom of expression or should be more oriented to taking down um, hate speech. The question is like, it's, it's, not, it's not about could they or should they, they already are, right? They're already drawing these boundaries, but they're doing so inconsistently or often inconsistently or sometimes guided by their own internal policies. And the question that I wanna raise is sort of the one that goes above that is, okay, we know that this is the status quo. We know that, that that means that these companies act from whatever their own sort of moral compass is. Is that the way we wanna go forward, right? Because it's very clear that when it comes to platforms, moderated content, we've made a decision, or at least that's a little bit different depending on where you're based, but we made a decision that we want some sort of democratic oversight of that, that we want to have some sort of notion of the fact that these companies are optimizing for what is good for society as opposed to what is good for their bottom line. And that conversation doesn't exist yet within the context of the internet infrastructure. Good. Daniel Gilmore asks, how would KYC regulations, uh, sorry, the question just jumped on me. How would K KYC regulations impact smaller infrastructure providers that aim to support anonymous public communication? Hi, DKG. Um, as always, uh, an amazing uh, question. So just to give a little bit of context, KYC regulations are uh, know your customer regulations. They're part of the EU DSA, and it essentially requires um, providers to know who they're providing their services to. Now, at the moment, that kind of regulation, to the extent of my knowledge, and I want to caveat here that I am not a regulatory expert on this, is not yet applied to minor players because it does raise all of these really thorny questions around, okay, but if we start doing that, what kind of, um, what kind of practices will we hinder that precisely help um, social movements in repressive countries that help uh, all sorts of individuals to be able to stay anonymous online, which isn't always a bad thing. Um, so I do think that that is, that is a, a really good question, like applying these KYC regulations to smaller infrastructure providers could have very negative ramifications. Um, but we are seeing that debate, at least within the context of the EU. I think there were some recent amendments made in the parliament around this. And um, again, wherever you fall on that, I think the question is we do need to have these debates explicitly and we need people like you, DKG, to be able to make precisely that case, right? Because there isn't always this amount of nuance and understanding of you know, what good internet infrastructure providers do uh, as well, especially when they're smaller groups, especially when it's more open source focused. Thank you. Radhesh Ganti asks, what's your take on the role that these platforms, either ISP or social networks, should ideally play? And should they remain neutral or take action and filter based on some socially legally acceptable criteria? If I had the perfect answer to this question, I think I would be set for life. Um, I mean, I have a question, I have an answer to this question in terms of questioning the premises within what Radesh said, namely that you can say that there is a division between um, they are neutral entities versus they are political actors. Now, I wanna reject that dichotomy. These organizations, these, these technical organizations are always political actors, right? And it might not seem that way to them, but they are because they do decide, you know, on a daily basis, how we connect, what information is online and what isn't. And one of the ways that I've tried to sort of explain this is by saying, you know, a doctor isn't a doctor on the day that, she kills her patient. Mm -hmm. She's a doctor on the day that all of her patients live. 
right? You are not a neutral actor when everything goes right and a political actor when everything goes wrong. You are a political actor every day. And the question is, and, and again, like this question looks different depending on what kind of technical actors we are talking about. But the question here is like, how do you do that in a way that's responsible? Um, filtering is not necessarily, I wanna, something that I wanna get into is, is in, apart from saying that it is incredibly complicated, um, especially in regions where um, what is considered to be socially accepted or legally acceptable criteria can still be incredibly repressive. But again, that points at the fact that we need to start having these conversations about how to deal with issues of internet infrastructure interventions in politics. Thank you. Aista uh, Klimasukati asks, do we have enough normative theories to guide these expectations of how the internet should work, at least the political gatekeeping? So do we have the right normative theories to help us think through these problems? I mean, I don't think it's for lack of theory mm. that we are where we are. The problem is that there are really strong economic, political, cultural incentives that mean that, you know, theories around an ethics of care or harm reduction or all of these other notions that we have from feminist SDS and, and other fields aren't applied. So I'm, I'm not too worried about the dearth of, you know, thinking about what good should look like. I'm worried about can we overcome the current hurdles that exist to even having that conversation in earnest. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Rob Wilton asks, have you done any evaluation of the standards that IETF um, produces and where there may be a trade-off between end user privacy versus security, depending on whether you regard government security services as being a good or bad thing. The IETF as an open organization is making significant decisions based on the contributors' experiences and belief of what is either right for end users or for the corporation, corporate organization that they represent. Right, no, I mean, this is this particular dynamic of who decides what is good for the end user is, is obviously something that came up repeatedly during my field work. Um, one of the dynamics that I identify that at least within the context of the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, there is a bit of a tendency of the participants to, um, to do one, one of two or to do two things. First, to obviously frame what is good for the end user as whatever is good for their business model. And that's not entirely unfair, right? Like what is good um, for particular network operators is something that you can enumerate. Um, so that's one thing. So it tends to be, it tends to be this sort of vassal, the end user becomes this vassal that, that people fill with, with you know, what their um, corporate needs are. And what you also see is that because the, um, Internet Engineering Task Force is an organization that prides itself on what they call individual contribution. So the notion that yes, Google paid for me to be here, but I'm not here to be Google's mouthpiece. I'm here with my own independent sort of um, thoughts and feelings about technology. Now we can have a whole separate conversation about the extent to which that separation really exists in practice, but mm -hmm. let's assume it does. Then you still see that within the ITF, there is this really um, noticeable um, preference for particular values. So for privacy, um, for protection from especially government surveillance. But this is not a space where there is a really mature conversation about, okay, um, how do we think about issues of um, discrimination, of racism, of sexism, um, uh, all these sort of broader values that you do see being discussed in, in mm -hmm. other technical fields. 
So I think that's that's one of the things that you see is that uh, a lot of IETFers tend to think about the end user like they think about themselves. So like, what would I like? Well, I would like privacy from my government, um, but I also would like you not to put any restrictions on my ability to use language that you find offensive because the fact that you feel that way is about you and your feelings. So there's a lot of these dynamics going on as well that are that are interesting to note and somewhat painful to note at times as well. We are right at the end of our time. Um, we have just a couple of minutes to end the session. Um, Corinne, I want to thank you. This has been fantastic. We have many questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Corinne will be sending out um, uh, we will be sending out from the department a list of resources and to follow up on this. And so maybe she'll be able to get to some of those qu follow up questions then and there. I also want to take a moment. This is the last of our Wednesday webinars here at the Oxford Internet Institute for this academic year. And if I can just personally thank Isabel Malcolm, she has been the voice of calm reason she has helped so many of our speakers, both emerging and established, um, putting them at ease, running these events for our growing and uh, extended audience, making sure we deliver really smart education um, through this medium in, and learning to do it. We've all learned how to do this in, in kind of new ways. And Isabel's just been a star. So I know she's, um, she usually pops on and gives a, a, a wonderful closing statement about, about um, signing us off. And we're gonna sign off this evening uh, because we don't have the next event planned. So please look for us to return next autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, that would be October for the rest of the world. Um, look for us to return in October and have a wonderful day, evening, um, summer, if you're here in the Northern Hemisphere, um, a, a calm winter, if you're in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Thank you again for being a part of this this year. And thank, thank you again, Corinne, for joining us today. Good night. <laughs>